Welcome to the Superpod podcast. I'm Emily Ball from Active Step Foot and Ankle Clinic. This podcast is going to talk about podiatry, lifestyle and health and fitness. And today's topic is about the myths of pronation um, and some of the misperceptions of it in the running community. And we're also going to talk about running shoe selection. I'm joined today by Jim Davies, who's one of our brilliant podiatrists at Active Step. He's also a Southampton Athletics running coach. And if you don't mind me saying, Jim, you're actually a pretty good runner yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I perhaps wouldn't describe myself as a very good runner, but thank you nonetheless. <laughs> First of all, just tell us a bit about how you got into running. So I first got into running probably best part of 10 years ago. Um, my stepfather was always an avid road runner and racer. Um, I used to be heavily involved in martial arts and I did a little bit of running for fitness. Um, for years, my stepfather was trying to get me involved in his running club. And I think it was 2009, I entered a 5K race with him. He was in his 50s then, I think, and I was in my mid-twenties and I got soundly beaten by him um, <laughs> and being reasonably competitive by nature uh, uh, that didn't uh, please me so I got into training, uh, joined a running club um, within a year I think I was captain of the running club that I joined um, wow. and the rest is history, running is now my life um, I don't do any other sports really other than running um, and, and coach for Southampton, compete for Southampton and uh, take it all a, probably a bit too seriously. Excellent. Can you tell us a bit about your history in terms of injuries? Um, unfortunately, injuries are part and parcel of being a runner, really. Um, I think if you, anything more than a, a couple of uh, easy runs a week, and most runners will have experienced niggles and injuries at some point. Um, I think. When I first got into running, I had the classic shin splints or yep, sure. medial tibial stress syndrome, um, which I didn't really do anything with. I saw a sports massage therapist. I got a few massages and it went away on its own. More luck than judgment, probably. Um, as my body adapted to running, I would say there was a, a, a lovely period where I didn't have too many injuries because sure. my body was then adjusted to running regularly but my training wasn't serious enough that I wasn't putting myself through the mill perhaps as much as a competitive club runner does. So I was in this grace period where I could do quite a lot of running and not get too injured because the intensity wasn't there and to be honest, the, the volume wasn't there. Once I started to take my running a bit more seriously, become a bit more competitive, especially moved towards an athletics club as opposed to a road running club, um, I started doing some more middle distance training, real high intensity stuff. I then started finding all the little inherent weaknesses um, in my lower limbs and, and picked up most injuries that runners talk about from uh, IT, ITB um, runner's knee, sure. ITB syndrome, yep. um, plantar fasciitis, um, probably some more shin splints. Um, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we, we see an awful lot of, of, of runners mm -hmm. um, as patients. And um, I think um, the most common causes of most of these injuries are probably training error. Yep. Um, so either previous history of maybe unmanaged injuries, mm -hmm. um, possibly too much too soon, maybe taking on a new regime and, and um, you know, building up too quickly. Um, but I don't know about you, but you know, quite often a, a lot of the um, patient's thoughts around their injuries is actually to do with the footwear that they're wearing. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head too much too soon. That's a great phrase and it's, we use it a lot, but it's, it's so true. It, and that can be too much volume or too much intensity or, or too much in terms of frequency. And often you can, if you look for patterns in training, you can find something changed with one of those three things and that'll be the too much too soon. And that's more likely the cause of the injury um, because there might be an inherent weakness. Whereas there's a tendency with a lot of runners to us believe that a running shoe can either help prevent an injury or a running shoe or a change of running shoe could have been the cause of an injury. I think when people get injured, um, you often look back and see what changed. And if people changed the running shoe or if, if even if they didn't change the running shoe, they had the same running shoe for a long time and they thought it had been worn out, they'll look to point the finger at a shoe. Sure, um, I see the same thing. Yeah, that seems, mm. seems to be a common thing. And it's, it's completely understandable. And I, I was probably guilty of that when I got into running um, because, you know, most runners aren't um, MSK 
specialists and they may not of understand course. much that's going on um, on a soft tissue level, but it's very easy to see the big bit of leather and plastic and rubber that you attach to your foot. Um, I think sometimes there's that tendency to look for an easy fix as yeah. well. Um, and buying a new pair of shoes is, is quite probably the easiest thing that you can do. Whereas maybe going to see a specialist and going through a rehab program, that's a lot more time consuming mm -hmm. and you know requires a lot more motivation and commitment. Yeah, and also you get a buzz from buying a new pair of shoes. I have quite an extensive <laughs> shoe collection. This it's is a lovely <laughs> collection, by the way. <laughs> some of them are clean, some of them aren't. Um, but, but buying a new pair of shoes, it's buying a new shiny thing, isn't it? It's like buying a new watch or a new car. People like to buy things and have something new and shiny. So if there's the suggestion that you can get that thrill of a, a new expensive shiny running shoe and it may also prevent an injury or cure an existing injury. Which is what our patients quite often believe. Why wouldn't you go down yeah. that route? And I think anecdotally, um, between runners, there's people will find what works for them and people will look at their history and say, oh, this shoe definitely gave me shin splints or this shoe sorted out my Achilles tendinopathy. And a runner may pass that information to their club mates or their friends and sure. family. Um, and then that's that's That advice may not work for that, for that Absolutely person. Absolutely not, no. Running shoes can be very individual. Um, there's, as we might go into, limited evidence to suggest that running shoes can treat any pathologies or injuries or prevent any pathologies or injuries per se. Let's go into that in a bit more detail. So one thing you may not know about me is that when I was training to be a podiatrist, I worked in a specialist running store. Mm -hmm. And I vividly remember being trained on this whole model of selecting a shoe based on somebody's foot posture. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by foot posture is whether they rolled in, rolled out or had a fairly kind of neutral stance. Um, and I remember looking at the wall in the running, um, running store and all the trainers were actually segmented into these categories. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have a category for people that needed extra cushioning if they had a high arched rigid foot. Um, we had um, a category for people that rolled in, which was um, named support shoes. Mm -hmm. And then for those that had significantly flat feet mm -hmm. and they were called motion control. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and we were very much trained to identify what category to put those um, customers in and select footwear based on that with the idea that it would um, potentially prevent them from getting injured. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously since then, I'm now a fully trained um, podiatrist and I specialize in, in sports and musculoskeletal podiatry and, and see a lot of runners and, and, and sports people, um, as, as do you do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we know now from the evidence that actually this whole model, which, which is probably designed more so by the running industry rather than health professionals like ourselves, is actually quite flawed. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the terms that I hear banded around, and I'm sure you do from your running mates as well, is the term pronation. Can you describe to anybody that's listening today that maybe hasn't heard or is a bit unfamiliar with that term what pronation means? Sure. Um, it, as you say, it's a term that most runners will have heard, um, either from someone in a running shop or a friend or a coach. Um, but pronation, first and foremost, is a completely natural movement. And I would say 99.9% .9 of the humans on the planet, of humans on the planet, pronate. Um, it's it's describing a movement and it's a healthy, normal movement. And if we didn't pronate, we would have great difficulty moving. We pronate at the ankle and we also pronate at the wrist. It's not um, isolated to the ankle, that movement. And it involves the movement of the toes. I don't know if, if my, my foot's being picked up here, but generally it's, it's a tri, what we call a triplanar movement. So there are movement in three um, planes of movement. The toes will move out. The calcaneus, the heel bone, will invert or roll in, yeah? And the toes will also move up towards the shin. So that's the opposite of a ballet dancer. If you think a ballet dancer would point with pronation, you're putting the toes up towards the shin, toes out like Charlie Chaplin, and then the heel bone will tend to tilt in at the back. So it will evert. So, so we're rolling in. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> let's get the terminology quite right. So we're rolling in, out and um, up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
difficult to describe, isn't it? Because actually it most people would describe it as simply just rolling in, but like you say, it's actually three movements. Yeah, so when it's when it's seen um, classically uh, by a uh, <laughs> running store assistant on a treadmill um, from behind, a fixed viewpoint from behind, you it's, it's characterised by the rolling in of the ankles, isn't it? Sure. Um, there's actually, as we said... And it's essential for absorbing ground reaction forces. Yeah, it's your body's yeah. way of absorbing the reaction force and helping you move through stance from, from that contact, through, st through mid stance and then to toe off. Sure, propulsion um, phase. Yeah, it's a completely natural and necessary part of, of, of gait. So from your experience of working with runners um, mm. and seeing runners every day, because you run every day, right? Yeah. Um, what, what are runners' perceptions of pronation? So... It is, I would say, a myth that is perpetuated still by many runners, even very high level runners and lots of coaches that pronation is bad or pronation, too much pronation is bad. It should be limited um, if you are an over pronator. That's a phrase that's banded around a lot, um, which probably shouldn't be a, a phrase that's well, pr probably shouldn't exist as a phrase, let alone be used, because it's there certainly is, a non-medical term, isn't it? It's a non-medical <laughs> term. There's there's no there's no agreed or defined amount of normal pronation for a, for a human being. Mm. Um, there's no normal range of pronation. So to categorise and to label somebody as an overpronator, I think it's not only unhelpful, it's almost pretty impossible. I don't think you and I could do that, even with our background. You couldn't label someone as an overpronator because no, we sure. don't know what a normal amount of pronation is. Um, but I can understand why it's, uh, as you say, it may have been perpetuated by the running shoe industry. I think if we go back maybe 15 or 20 years, um, it's a nice way of, of labelling people, categorising people and um, prescribing uh, a piece of equipment that they need for the way that they move. I think it's, um, I don't think people, you know, Running, running store sales assistants aren't intentionally doing anything wrong. They're not trying no, to mislead. Course, yeah. They are taught that, you know, people can be supernators, a neutral um, runner or a pronated runner. And if people are a pronated runner or have a pronated stance, that should be supported or corrected. And you see the, 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 the diagrams of a, of a line running down the back of the calf and through the, uh, the, the heel bone. And that the ideal is that it's a nice straight line and they think, either side of that straight line should be corrected. Um, the term corrected isn't, isn't, a, isn't a, uh, a helpful phrase because many, many, many people, I think, you know, between 60 and 80% of people will, uh, of runners, will uh, have a resting pronated position sure. to some yeah. extent. Most of us w would. So yeah. it's, it's something that nearly all humans do. Why are we categorising it as something that's wrong, bad, or needs correcting? Sure. Um, also, just labelling people full stop. I think in a in a um, clinical or a therapeutical sense is unhelpful because people can hold on to a label and think that it, they'll carry that with them for a long time. Sure. And we see it in clinic, and I see it in the running club. People who have been told at some point by somebody in a running store, perhaps, or by a friend or a coach, "Oh, you're a pronator." that's going to cause you a problem. Sure, um, which is absolutely not, not necessarily the case. It's not the case. There, so, so if we look at the evidence, there is, there is no evidence to suggest that people who have a slightly, mildly pronated standing position are at more risk of being injured or picking up an injury or a pathology. I think there is some evidence that an extremely pronated foot, sure, yeah, like a completely flat arch. And I think with things like medial tibial stress syndrome, it has been shown to be a component yeah. um, of being at higher risk of developing that particular condition. Yeah, but by the same token, so has a really supinated Absolutely. foot, which is going yeah. the other way, so rolling out. Um, so for most people who aren't extremely pronated in that in that resting position pronation doesn't determine your risk of injury sure per se and that's a key takeaway there is no evidence to suggest um in the majority of, of people that being um, a pronator is necessarily um going to increase your risk of injury yeah absolutely um there's also limited evidence to suggest that a particular type of running shoe, a support or a structured running shoe, which generally just tend to have a sort of a slightly denser foam on the inside. Yes, it's normally um, a bit more dense on the EVA 
um, on the medial aspect there, isn't it? And the, the, the premise there is that it will prevent or slow or control that pronation, but mm. there is no evidence to suggest. In fact, there's more evidence to suggest that the foot is actually still pronating in, in the shoe yes. um, when tested within shoe equipment. Yeah, yeah. So there is no evidence, there's no evidence for running shoe prescription of that sort. Um, but it is, I, I, I was looking at, um, I, I'm not sure if I should name the website or not, a very big, well-known sports shoe retailer. Sure. Um, who sells shoes from all sorts of different brands and they had a running shoe selection calculator page. Yeah, I mean, quite often these, um, there are some stores that will use the wet foot test Absolutely, where you get yeah. out the bath and then you look at your footprint when you get out the bath. And, yeah. um, and depending on how much foot you can see or how much arch there is, um, that will determine what shoe you should select from them. And it's interesting how the answer is always a shoe, yeah. isn't it? So yes. whatever someone's problem is um, in that setting, the answer is always a certain shoe. Yeah. Um, when actually maybe, you know, we should be sort of advocating that if someone has an issue, they should see a specialist like a, a podiatrist or a physio or, or somebody that's well placed to, um, to diagnose the issue. Yeah, and I think that's the, the key takeaway. If, if you're running and you're generally pain free and injury free, there is no need to base your shoe choice on the wet footprint that you leave on a piece of brown paper. If you have a pain or an injury, whether it's acute and it's new or whether it's recurring, the best thing you could do for that is to see a professional be that a podiatrist, be that a physiotherapist, whoever, see a, a professional and find the cause of that injury and get the, the cause of that injury. Get a proper diagnosis first sure. and then treat the cause of that injury. Sure. Um, whereas running shoes aren't going to treat an injury and there's, 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 there's no evidence for running shoe prescription, which is still a really big thing in the market now. So I would imagine anybody that's watching or listening to this podcast right now, they're probably sat there thinking, wow, OK, so, you know, this is this is um, information that I've been, you know, um, fed for many years. You know, I've been buying shoes for years. I've always selected my shoes on this basis. Should I change my footwear? Not necessarily, no. If you're not picking up injuries, if your footwear is comfortable for you and it's fit for purpose, stick with it. If, sure. if, you find if it's not broke, don't fix it type yeah, approach. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, I have, I used to only wear Adidas. I just like the way they fitted my foot. Um, most running shoe companies tend to make their shoes around the same last. The last is the cobbler's last, which is what they form the, the basis of the shoe around. And Adidas are quite a narrow fit. So for people with really wide feet, they're not great. But for me, I found they were a really nice, comfortable fit. I've since sort of broadened my horizons and I have recently got into to Nike's. The and super shoes. And some of the new super shoes. Um, but I would recommend picking a shoe based primarily on, on the fit of the shoe. So it needs, to, it needs to fit your foot. And the fit of a running shoe would, should be slightly different to your day-to-day -day shoe. Okay. Um, in a few respects. So most runners are more comfortable going up half a size or maybe even a full size from their day-to-day -day shoe in a running shoe. You're probably looking at having maybe a centimetre and a half to two centimetre gap between your longest toe, which is not always your big toe. Some in a lot of runners, including myself, it my, could be the second my toe. second toe is longer. So whatever your longest toe is, you should have you know, a finger width gap in between that toe and the very front of the shoe. And I know when I'm assessing footwear myself, I always get the person to stand up mm -hmm. because their foot is at its biggest when they're standing. Mm -hmm. And I actually use um, a thumbnail, which is probably about the same as what you're, you're yep. suggesting, and push down to make sure there's enough space at the end of the shoe. Yep. Um, and I also find the longer somebody is doing in terms of a distance, so if they're a marathon runner, they may even need to go up a little bit more. Absolutely. Um, because the foot's expanding in the shoe as they obviously, you know, um, get hot. Yeah, yeah. So feet can expand as you run. As you say, the longer you run, the more likely that e expansion is going to um, uh, need, the, your, your foot's going to need the extra space. Um, and also if you're, if you're running downhill, your, your foot tends to want to slip forward. So sure. obviously you need to make sure that it, they're laced securely, but having that extra space at the front can prevent black toenails and painful back pressure on the, on the nails. Excellent. So um, what other features would you select on as opposed to this 
this, this category of pronation or supination. So if I was a new runner, for instance, and I was going to a running store or I started out running and I wanted to get a new pair of trainers, what should I primarily be selecting my shoes on? So I think firstly, to, to help narrow it down, because it can be pretty um, daunting. daunting walking mm. into a running so shop, many seeing options a now. wall of different coloured running shoes of different types of different brands. Firstly, mm -hmm. consider the surface that you're likely to spend most of your time on. So if most of your running is going to be pavement running, tarmac running, etc., then you're probably looking for a road-based shoe. Sure. Which it, would be which one? Pretty all much, of them, actually. Pretty much yeah. all of these. <laughs> um, that's, this, this is a race shoe. The rest are, are pretty much sta just standard running shoes. Um, so, so any of these. Um, this is this is a nicely um, built shoe. It's a, I think it's what is it? It's the Adidas Glide Boost. Um, it's quite a lot of shoe. It's not super lightweight. It gives you quite a bit of protection, but it is a road shoe. So it's designed to run on tarmac. Um, it can cope with wet tarmac. Um, but that's probably your first consideration, is what surface you're going to be running on. Sure, as opposed to if you were running in the woods or on trails if, or the if, beach. If you lived in the sticks or if you lived in, um, you know, out in the country and you're going to spend a lot of time on trail or gravel or, or grass and mud, you may want to look at a, a trail shoe, um, which essentially the upper part of the shoe might not be that different. It might be a little bit more robust around the toe box, just in case. And slightly more weather resistant. A little bit more yeah. weather resistant, but the, the main difference would be on the sole and it's going to have uh, probably a grippier sole, maybe sure. some lugs, basically, you know, the same principle that a football boot has studs on for running on muddy, muddy grass. A trail running shoe has, has, has a grippier, more luggy. Uh, and it may probably so, feel a slightly less cushioned than a road shoe. Yeah, yeah, because you're not running on tarmac and generally if you're running off road on sloppy surfaces, you don't need quite as much cushioning because the, the ground's softer anyway. Now, you mentioned that you also have a racing shoe. Mm -hmm. So um, another question that I hear quite a lot is, should I have more than one pair? Mm. What would you say? Oh, obviously, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I have <clears throat> quite a few running shoes. So initially, I think when I first got into running, I had... I think two pairs of trainers. I had one pair for running on road and one pair for running off road. And that's a great starting point for a lot of people. Um, if you're not going to run off road, you probably only need one shoe. If you're, if you're um, not going to run on road, you probably only need the trail shoe. Um, as your running journey progresses, you may find that you want to have a lighter shoe for race day. So if you're training for a 5k race or a park run or a 10k race, you might find that you want to do a lot of your training in a you know slightly heavier um, um, cushioned shoe um, and then on race day transfer to a lighter shoe. I know when I worked in the running store we used to have a couple of racing flat options um, and I think one of the features of that is that because it is more lightweight and there's less to it they just don't last as long um, and it was interesting because there were some people that just preferred the feel of a racing flat because it was lighter but actually didn't appreciate that it would wear out quicker. Yeah so, <laughs> so that they do feel nice um, they're not suitable for, for absolutely everybody um, some people if you're if you're um, a, a heavier runner, for example, a very, very lightweight racing flat with not much cushioning at all, um, especially if you're not conditioned to using that shoe. If you suddenly switch to it and then go and run a half marathon, sure. you, you may be running the risk of, of um, um, putting your body through some stresses that it's not used to. But for the majority of runners, training in a heavier, more cushioned shoe for the majority of their mileage and then tra changing up to a lighter, less cushioned shoe on race day um, it's a lighter shoe, so you feel better running faster in it, but I think there's also a psychological element when you put on a lightweight racing shoe, you know it's game time, it's race time, um, and you're, you're ready to go. What other considerations would you, w would you, you know, um, discuss with your patients, for instance, that are maybe, I'm going to say a bit like me, okay, so middle-aged, I've had a couple of children. I'm not necessarily strong or fit, but I want to run, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and there are so many shoes on the market. And, and forgive me, but you might, you might be sort of caught up in the whole sort of Nike um, Alpha Flies and everything. Mm -hmm. and I think, oh, wow, you know, that looks really cool. And, and you've also got the Zero Drop shoes. You've mm -hmm. got the Hocker, which is a rocker sold maximal shoe. Um, for anyone that doesn't know what the Hocker is, it's um, a really cushioned shoe, um, which, which has a kind of um, rocker built into it, which helps with sort of transitioning forward. Mm -hmm. um, for someone that, you know, that maybe is getting into running that's like me, that isn't fit, isn't going to be fast, but just wants to get out um, and stay healthy, 
how, how, you know, what, what would you say to those people that have all this choice in front of them? So going back to, as I was saying, your initial choice will probably be based on the surface you're likely to spend most of your time running on. OK, so uh, it doesn't matter whether I um, try on a, a rocker sold hocker shoe or um, a zero drop. I, I, I would imagine for the majority of people who are getting into running or who have done a bit of running in the past, perhaps a, a zero drop would be uh, a change to what their foot and their biomechanics are used to. So, okay, yeah. so perhaps... And actually uh, there is some evidence that says extreme changes from one type of shoe to another in a short space of time can increase somebody's risk of injury, right? So, yeah, there's yeah. a great phrase I like, which is tissues don't like surprises. So if you've spent a lot of time in, in minimalist shoes or zero drop shoes, um, and you're conditioned to that, or you've even spent time running barefoot on grass if you grew up without shoes, then you'd probably be okay. If you spent a lot of time in a built-up trainer, most trainers, most day-to-day -day shoes, mine and yours, they've all got a bit of a heel. So you're conditioned to that and you're used to that. And if you suddenly take that away and ask you, your body to go through the rigmarole of running, you're perhaps um, uh, risking uh, uh, some tissue stress that, that may result in some form of injury. So, That's really good advice. Yeah. <laughs> with that in mind, I would, as I say, firstly ascertain uh, the, the correct fit of a trainer. Sure. So um, let's say if you're a size seven, you might want to try on in the running shop seven and a half, eights, but go by how it feels on your foot mm -hmm. and how much space you can feel at the front. Don't be too caught up in the number because it would be great if, if a size 8 was a uniform size 8 across all manufacturers. But it varies between it different absolutely. brands. So mm. people get really caught up in, you know, I'm an 8, I must take an 8. Mm. Try on different sizes. Try a size up, try a size down, maybe. More likely with a running shoe, you want to go up a couple of sizes because you do want that space at the end. Um, but try on a few different brands. Try on a few different styles. Most running shops do have a treadmill. Um, if a sales assistant is telling you you need a particular type of shoe because you pronate, uh, perhaps, you know, smile and, and listen to what they have to say. But I think comfort is a better um, The body's guide. very good um, at having a comfort filter and giving you an indication of whether it's going to be a good option for you. Yeah, if you put a shoe on and whether you're told it's the right shoe for you or not, it's uncomfortable, it feels unusual, different. Mm. Times that by 10 when you've done five miles. A absolutely. <laughs> so try on a few brands, a few styles, maybe a rocker bottom, a hoka. Some people absolutely love them. That it's quite a unique feel, having that real rocker bottom to the bottom of a running shoe. Some people don't get on with it at all. Tr try them. Uh, most running shops, global pandemic aside, most running mm. shops will allow you to, to go in and try a few different sizes, a few different brands and see what's right for you. But I would say size, um, fit for purpose, so surf, fit for the surface you're going to be running on. Um, and I think as well that some people don't realise that you can actually get wider fit running shoes. So there's a couple of brands like New Balance and Brooks that will actually go up to maybe 2E fit, mm -hmm. um, um, whereas the standard for a woman is a B width and the, and the men's are the D width. So if you've got sort of um, bunions or a slightly broader foot um, or you suffer with numb toes or anything like that or any kind of forefoot pain, mm -hmm. um, then just ask the shop assistants if they've got a wider fit um, mm -hmm. or if they can order them in because they're not always available on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's been really interesting. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so key takeaways are obviously fit, um, fit for purpose in terms of choosing the right design, um, building up gradually um, from an injury perspective so that you don't overload your tissues. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. No sudden changes, no massive or large increases in frequency, duration or intensity. If you're going to change any of those, choose one sure and, and, and build up build it up slowly yeah. and I think probably the biggest message um, you know is about pronation and that it's not necessarily a bad thing um, in fact it's not a bad thing in most cases um, and that we probably ought to be thinking um, more broadly about selecting our footwear on other factors as opposed to using this historic model of um, whether somebody is a pronator or a supinator. Yeah, I think it's a narrative that's going to be with us for a long time. I, sure, yeah. You know, I think more people are aware that than ever that pronation mm. is a natural movement and it shouldn't be feared. But um, I had a, I was messaging a few friends last night before we did this podcast. And as I say, I, I, I messaged some ex-marines, some very, very good runners, um, some um, people who are more new to running, and they were all coming back with similar questions. And I said, is there anything you'd like to know about running shoes or pronation? And the majority of them were asking, 
how much pronation is over pronation? Should I be worried about pronating? Does, it, does pronation definitely mean I will get, be more at risk of injury? So it's a narrative that's going to be with us for a while, I think. Um, but I think the message needs to be it shouldn't, it shouldn't be feared. It's something we all do. I pronate when I walk. I pronate when I run. Um, don't base running shoe choice on how much you pronate or don't. And there you go. There's your key message. <laughs> So thanks for joining us today, Jim. It's been really interesting. Thanks um, for having me. If anybody has any further questions about pronation or if they've got any questions about choosing running shoes or they'd like some advice on any running related injuries, then please pop them in the comments below. Um, we'll endeavour to get back to you about those. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>